I will now uh, open the meeting and would like to take the time to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver campus uh, is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge that the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. We'll have a slide which uh, describes the uh, three-part program, uh, starting with our annual business meeting, then an award ceremony, and then our featured guest speaker. We will start with a moment of silence to honor those who have passed away this last year. Thank you. Uh, we now uh, will start with the business meeting and approval of the agenda. Um, we have one uh, correction uh, to make, which is that Richard Spencer will not be uh, providing us uh, the financial uh, report of the college for your information. Uh, we have not yet received the final uh, report from uh, UBC Finance Services yet, uh, but you will receive this uh, in future. If there are no other changes uh, to the agenda, then I think if any of these go up, and I take this as accepted. I now seek approval of the minutes of our last meeting on uh, May 4th, 2022, and ask if there are any uh, additions, additions to make. And uh, hearing none or seeing none, I take uh, these minutes uh, as approved. I will have the next slide, please. And the next slide. So, what is the college and who are we in 2023? Well, we've actually realized that we're five years old. Time flies when uh, you've had three years uh, out of uh, contact with a pandemic. We now have 1,851 um, members and Emeriti represent 20% of UBC's academics. 99 new Emeriti were acknowledged by Senate this last year, and six members uh, applied uh, to, be, uh, to join the college, and uh, their application was approved by council. Five individuals were invested in the Order of uh, Canada, and now make uh, 24 of our Emeriti who have received this uh, recognition uh, since uh, they retired. Uh, and that's as of 2018 when the college was formed. And uh, we have previously uh, introduced uh, Queenie and Sarah as uh, two of our new staff. Next slide. What we did in 22-23, it was a busy year. 91 events were undertaken by the college and uh, uh, developed by uh, the large number of volunteers that we have uh, and uh, supported by our staff. We had 58 meetings of eight special interest groups and three of these groups uh, regularly had speaker programs and involved a total of 37 speakers. And then we had 21 program events which involved an additional 37 speakers. There were 20 speakers for the six part series with Green College, which has been an ongoing partnership. This year, uh, the topic was on disciplines over time. 
and uh, featured a panel discussion amongst uh, three individuals at different stages of their career. Uh, last year, we were invited to create an emeritus cohort for the Peter Wall Institute of Academic Studies on their climate and nature emergency. And uh, the cohort of uh, nine individuals from 11 uh, faculties um, developed a speaker program, uh, which was just superb. Uh, 12 speakers who spoke from many different perspectives, law, forestry, political science, on aspects of the uh, impact of the climate and nature emergency. So a tremendous showcasing of interdisciplinary, uh, and really uh, a, a key aim of, of what the college uh, does and a strong mm -hmm. Indigenous voice, great respect shown for uh, Indigenous uh, practices and beliefs. We co-sponsored with Faculty Relation uh, two retirement workshops uh, that uh, involved 150 faculty considering retirement. 90 are on a wait list, and so there's been a decision to hold a third workshop at the end of June. We reimbursed 19 emeriti from 15 departments, a total of $27,855 for expenses related to their ongoing scholarly activities. We have a larger budget uh, for this, but a limited number of applications uh, these last couple of years, uh, mostly related to the lack of travel and attending at in-person meetings um, by our uh, active emeriti. And then we've had some very encouraging meetings uh, with the interim president um, who uh, pointed out that uh, she is herself an emerita and uh, also a member of the college and looking forward to when she can truly retire from her current uh, position and, uh, and uh, partake more of the events. She's an active volunteer and is going to be attending the uh, meeting of the volunteer uh, community volunteer group uh, next week. We had a very good meeting uh, at the executive with the new uh, provost, Dr. Uh, Averill, who also pointed out that he is at a point where he could be emeritus, but was uh, attracted to uh, continuing his administrative uh, work. And then Paul Harrison and I met with uh, a meeting of the deans of the 12 faculties and uh, had a, a really uh, good uh, discussion with them, um, partly to talk about what the college does, but also to hear from them um, what they would, uh, what kind of administrative support they would like uh, to uh, raise awareness for their faculty of retirement options. And then next week, Paul Harrison and I are meeting with the department heads uh, and directors. So as I say, it's been a very busy year. I think we're really moving forward in showcasing uh, uh, the college, making people aware that we're um, here and what we're doing. And uh, I look forward to next year. We're actively planning events uh, upcoming. And uh, so I will say thank you to everybody who has been involved this year in working on the events and for those of you who have taken their time to attend. So thank you. I now will introduce Joost Bloom, who was the head and past principal of the nominating committee. Joost. Thanks very much, Anne. Um, on behalf of the nominating committee, the other members of which were Linda Leonard and Richard Unger, uh, I have great pleasure to uh, announce the el due election of the uh, new principal and vice principal and the new members of members at large of council. And um, although these are uh, headlined by acclamation, that's slightly misleading. Uh, there was only the the one no nominee per position. Uh, but by the rules of the college, there must be a vote, and the, each candidate, in order to be elected, must get a majority of the votes cast, and happily, that was uh, successful. So um, the, the uh, principle for the upcoming year uh, is, uh, and the 
vice principal this past year uh, was is Paul Harrison. Uh, the uh, incoming vice principal is uh, Bill McCutcheon. And uh, if we can just move to the members at large of council, um, we have the there are three council position members at large positions that uh, must be elected per year uh, for a three year term. And though you see the three uh, candidates elected to those positions, Nancy Gallini from Arts, uh, David Hill from Pharmaceutical Sciences, and Sandra Wilkins from the library. And in addition, one of the uh, current uh, members at large of council, uh, Neve Kelly, um, decided to uh, leave that position in order to devote more time to uh, writing projects that she has. And so we need to fill the remaining two years of her term and the candidate for that uh, and the elected uh, new member at large for that is Paul Steinbach from surgery. So those are the new members uh, of council and the new executive. And I just want to thank not only the nominating committee for their hard work, uh, but uh, I really want to thank all of these candidates for uh, being willing to serve in these capacities and very much want to thank also the members who voted in the election and took part in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Just. And I now uh, introduce Paul Harrison. I'm looking forward. Thank you, Anne. And hello, everyone. Um, I'm to look forward, but first I'd like to make some thank yous. Um, ne next slide, please. So first, uh, thank you to Gail, Sandra, Neve, and Marv, members at large whose terms are ending. Um, you have not been reluctant to bring important issues to the fore and to advocate for emeriti with diverse interests, all of this to the betterment of the college and the UBC. Uh, now that you're relieved of council duties, I hope you will still contribute to the college wherever your interests and talents lead you. Um, next to Yoast, um, past principals of the college have a tradition of continuing active engagement in the college affairs, and you certainly follow that model. Not only have you participated fully with Emeritus College Matters, but you represented the college on the conference committee for the Canada wide organization of retirees associations, that's CURAC, and may you continue in many ways to be active in the future. And Anne, it's been a distinct honor and pleasure to shadow you this past year. I hope I've learned enough to do a good job as principal. Uh, by guiding the development of the strategic plan and the communication plan, you have set the college on a clear path to greater relevance, both to our members and to UBC as a whole. I look forward to continuing to collaborate with you this next year uh, in an effort to ensure that all our college activities advance those two interconnected plans. We're in good shape thanks to you and your efforts. And to all members, the Emeritus College has achieved great things only thanks to the efforts and enthusiasm of a small number of dedicated staff in the office, Sandra, Queenie, and Sarah, and many volunteer emeriti, many but not yet enough. I know that you lead busy lives, but please consider ways in which you can contribute this year or next year or after that. Bring your ideas to the work of a committee. Suggest a topic for a seminar series and help to organize it. Get elected to council. There are many ways to make your mark. It is your Emeritus College. And finally, to the, the membership, thank you for the confidence you're placing in me. I look forward to being part of the leadership of this great organization in the coming year. Thank you all. Next slide. Is this is a call for any, any other business or questions from our our members attending? There appears to be no other business, so the business meeting of the AGM is uh, I declare it finished, and I will now call on. Um, Lynn for the next item of business.
And Lynn, you need to unmute. What a rookie error that was. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's my honor to have served as chair of the awards committee this year. Um, my two colleagues on the committee were both past winners of the Emeritus Award for Excellence, Dr. James Zydek, Emeritus Professor of Mathematics, a statistician, and Dr. Diana Lari, Emeritus Professor of History and a specialist in China. Our committee considered nominations both for the President's Award for Distinguished Service and for the Emeritus Award for Excellence, and we made recommendations to the President and to the Emeritus College Council. Having reviewed the nominations and the, the records of all of those who were nominated, we were struck by the richness and depth of resources represented by emeritus faculty and welcomed the opportunity to assist in bringing some recognition and shining a spotlight on the amazing work done by our colleagues. We're going to begin with the President's Award for Distinguished Service. And uh, Dr. Deborah Buzzard has um, pre recorded a video in which she will speak to that President's Award, which this year um, is being given to two recipients on our recommendation. I think you'll agree that both recipients have given remarkable, unique, and a highly effective level of service to the committee after their retirement. Could we run the video, please? Although I can't be with you in person, it gives me great pleasure to present the President's Award for Distinguished Service by UBC Emeriti to Dr. Robert Crowell and Dr. Patricia Shore. Let me say that I am particularly pleased to be able to participate in this event, albeit virtually, because I myself am Emerita Professor at UBC, and it's wonderful to see the achievements of my fellow Emeriti recognized. This award recognizes UBC Emeriti who've demonstrated exceptional effort or leadership in volunteer community contributions since attaining their emeritus status to the benefit of society in Canada or internationally. Through the award, we celebrate and honor Emeriti who have consistently demonstrated outstanding achievements beyond their scholarly work. Dr. Krell was selected for his contributions to Holocaust remembrance and education. Of particular note was his founding of the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center, which is a permanent community resource providing valuable education programs for students, teachers, indeed anyone wanting to learn more about the Holocaust. Dr. Shaw was selected for her contributions to documenting, teaching, revitalizing, and promoting Hunkaminum language. She continues to work on perfecting and expanding our current pedagogical materials, supervising doctoral students, and mentoring community language scholars and teachers, and advocating for ongoing community involvement in public academic discourse, and helping to structure new initiatives to further Hunkaminum focused study. Dr. Krell, Dr. Shore, I am honored to be able to present you both with the 2023 President's Award for Distinguished Service by UBC Emeriti. Hear, hear. <laughs> um, uh, I'd like to invite each of the uh, recipients to um, make a few remarks in turn, beginning with Dr. Krell. And by total coincidence, Dr. Krell, Krell is also going to be our guest speaker at this annual general meeting. Dr. Krell, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bouchard. Uh, it is a great honor. It's always special to receive recognition for something one does out of responsibility and necessity. As a child Holocaust survivor in hiding in Holland, it was my destiny at some point in life to draw attention to the vastness of the Holocaust, the Shoah in Hebrew, and its enormous consequences. I found some ways of doing this at UBC 
within the Department of Psychiatry in my child and family psychiatry clinic at the Health Sciences Center Hospital and in the wider community. Working within the framework of the Holocaust, one comes face to face with lethal anti-Semitism and must confront racism and prejudice. The Shoah was a pivotal event in modern times from which much can be learned, indeed must be learned. I will stop there as I have the honor of not only receiving this recognition, this precious award, but also invited to be your speaker today. Uh, thank you for all of it. I am proud to be a member of the Professors Emeriti of the University of British Columbia. Thank you very much. And may I say that the pr pride is mutual. We're proud to have you as one of our members, the Emeritus Thanks. College. May I now invite Dr. Patricia Shaw uh, to accept the President's award and to make some brief remarks. Thank you very much for <clears throat> the remarks. I'm truly deeply honored to be a recipient of this award. Um, first, I do want to raise my hands in acknowledgement of the extraordinary dedication and commitment of my colleagues at Musqueam, who've worked alongside me <clears throat> for many years now, who have inspired me and laughed with me and laughed at me. <laughs> like when we were starting the fishing unit and I, who am not a fisher person, must whim are definitely fisher people. Um, I called the lead line a rope. <laughs> Fundamentally, they taught me and the students in our Musqueam language program so many things beyond the challenges of working towards the revitalization of their extraordinary language, Hunkmium. And secondly, I would also like to acknowledge the many elders who have guided me over the years with rigor and courage and hope. These elders have often had to overcome their own traumatic lived experience of residential school language suppression in order to share their language with me, in order to trust me as a non-Indigenous person so that I could then work with the younger generations of their communities to help carry forward the wisdom, knowledge, and oral traditions of their ancestral heritage. I just want to comment that we are living, as <clears throat> you are all aware, in an era called the Anthropocene of precipitous loss, not only of biodiversity, but also of linguistic diversity. For any critically endangered language. What is at risk of being lost is the collective knowledge and wisdom accumulated through millennia about ways of being in this earthly world, ways of connecting to the spirit world, ways of adaptation to the environment, <clears throat> and ways of living together in a productive and self-sustaining society. I think maybe, given the state the world is in, we might not want to lose any of these. As you may be aware, the Pacific Northwest is recognized as one of five global hotspots of linguistic diversity. All of the languages here are critically endangered. <clears throat> these languages, like the Musqueam language, Hunkaminum, are spoken nowhere else in the world. Their language is truly an integral part of the unique identity of these peoples. Moreover, the structural complexities of these languages, especially the languages of the Salish and Wakashan language families, are linguistically renowned as extraordinary languages that stretch our scientific understandings of what a human language can be, and therefore of our essential understanding of what it means to be human. Language revitalization <clears throat> is not easy. A major challenge is often paucity of data, especially if there are no longer fluent first language speakers to work with, as is the case with Musqueam. Deeper and fundamentally more challenging issues <clears throat> relate to the systematic deprecation and suppression of these languages through the residential school system 
and through so many other layers of sociopolitical structure. In essence, many facets of language loss are part of the spectrum of psychological trauma that is at the heart of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls for action, which we're all engaged in. What is fundamentally essential for the success of a language revitalization program is community. And you're probably familiar with the saying, it takes a community to raise a child. It truly takes a community to revitalize a language. And two communities have made and continue to make profoundly significant contributions to the Musqueam language program. The Musqueam community, every age group has been engaged in all levels of community organization from the band council to the preschool, to the fisheries department who donate fish to every potluck and all the people who cook for us. And the second community is the UBC community. The First Nations House of Learning, the Huitwa Library, the admissions office, the registrar's office, been phenomenal. Faculty members and staff members who have actually taken the courses and contributed invaluably. So I'm particularly grateful to the many levels of administration at UBC who have supported and continue to support the development of a post-secondary curriculum to not only conduct research, which is traditional academic um, responsibilities in collaboration with Indigenous communities, but to actively teach these Indigenous languages here on campus and off campus in their home communities, long before the specific TRC call to action to do so. So UBC has been a national leader in that regard. And the impact is transformative, not only institutionally and at the community level, but also for hundreds of students, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. So why I mention these things is the thing about working with critically endangered languages and indigenous community is that a traditional retirement is not really a viable option. You can't leave these things behind, nor would it be my choice. Many of you know my colleague, Elder Larry Grant. He's 86. I have no option to retire. We just keep on, keep on going. So let me just mention um, a couple of things um, that are ongoing and will continue. I've been appointed as a member to the Board of Directors of the Endangered Language Fund, um, centered at Yale University, um, supporting the documentation and revitalization of languages across the world. Um, I continue to work in collaboration with a number of other institutes um, uh, focused in the states, supported by NSF, to teach particularly Indigenous scholars. And so training them to be the researchers um, in their own languages, which I think is fundamental for the true revitalization of a language. And um, in the interest of time, I won't mention anything else except for we're working on a graphic novel which is really fun um, to engage the teenage population. Kids' books are easy. Adult books are easy. The graphic novel should be lots of fun. So again, thank you very much for the honor. I appreciate it greatly. Well, thank you very much for your lifetime of work and for the fact that you've continued to, to do it. Um, and your wonderfully thoughtful comments. I think that everyone will agree with our committee that both of the recipients of the President's Award this year could not possibly better illustrate the kind of service that is material and significant to international, local, and um, domestic communities. So thank you very much, um, both Dr. Shaw and Dr. Krell. And thank you for accepting the award. Um, We'll now turn to the uh, UBC Emeritus College Award for Excellence in Innovative and Creative Endeavors. Uh, this award recognizes emeritus colleagues who display excellence in their engagement after retirement in innovative research, artistic creation, or new applications of previous research. 
And uh, Dr. Ann Junker will now present the award for excellence to this year's recipient. Thank you very much, Lynn, and thank you and uh, uh, Jim and Diana for uh, putting the time into uh, what can be difficult uh, decisions and uh, uh, the excellent uh, candidates that you proposed. Um, I, uh, it gives me great pleasure to honor this year's uh, recipient, uh, which is Roger Wilson, who is Professor Emeritus of Classical Near Eastern and Religious Studies. Those who nominated him uh, for this award told us that Roger has made and continues to make numerous significant scholarly contributions on the lived experience of the inhabitants of Roman Sicily, and is in fact the world's leading expert uh, on Roman Sicily. Roger is a prolific uh, author and since 2014 has published 46 papers, reviews and books in leading journals and with distinguished publishing companies, with several more accepted and impressed. He has continued to take on new projects and to accept invitations from the and contribute to uh, volumes, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, but most importantly, uh, he has continued to work in the field and to train students in the archeological uh, field <clears throat> by taking students to work with him on his sites. Excuse me, Roger, it gives me great pleasure to hand this award to you. Please accept my warmest congratulations. Well, thank you very much indeed for your kind words. And of course, I accept this award. I'm honored to receive it. And I accept it with a great deal of gratitude, a great deal of pleasure, and also with humility. And my first thanks must go to the Emeritus Committee um, for their work in assessing all the awards. I'm honoured and humbled that they should have regarded me as a worthy recipient of this award, and I'm grateful for their time. I've got a lot of thank yous that I have to make, and I'd like to go through them and, and say that this is not just an award for me. It is an award that is uh, only possible because of the support and help of many people. I think my next thanks go to my department, and in particular to its former head, Leanne Bablitz, who put together the application, and also to her successor, Michael Griffin, both of whom have been enormously supportive of my continued endeavors. I think some departmental heads like Emeriti to fade away into the shadows and not be any more a demand on their time and energy. But I'm afraid I've been a constant, um, I wouldn't say a problem, but a constant drain on their, um, on their time. And I'm very grateful to them for their support and for the fact that they've continued to encourage me in my various endeavors. I'd also like to pay a great tribute to my wife of nearly 42 years, Charlotte, who has always supported me in all my uh, various projects, has always been encouraging me and cheering, not necessarily just from the touch lines, but also been involved in my projects in various different capacities. It was she, for example, who accompanied uh, me on my various excavations in Sicily uh, since I've been an emeritus and has prepared the lunch each day for our students, for which we've always been very grateful. And to give you another example of the collaboration with her, uh, a couple of years ago, we published another volume in UBC Studies in the Ancient World, uh, in which I served as editor, and she, who is a professional book designer, uh, did the design and layout of that volume. So I have much to be grateful to have such a, a wonderful, loving support uh, from my wife for so long. I'd also like to pay a tribute to the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, who have continued to uh, finance the excavations that I've carried out in Sicily as an emeritus. Not every country in the world is so far-sighted as to support emeriti in this way. Many countries just say 65 and you're out and you have to go and retire whether you like it or not because we're not going to give you funding anymore. A shirk has the great um, capacity to recognize a good research project, and if you've got the ability to complete it, age does not matter. This is not an ageist committee, and I think it's greatly to their tribute 
that that is their attitude. So without their financial support, I wouldn't have been able to achieve uh, these things in recent years. I'd also like to point out that I owe an enormous debt of gratitude to my various collaborators. Archaeology is not the sort of thing that you do squirreled away in your own study on your own. It is multidisciplinary and involves many people in various different disciplines who collaborate in order to provide um, results. One of those collaborators, Fabrizio Ducati, is watching this, um, this uh, Zoom presentation at Palermo in Sicily, where he lives. And I'm delighted that he has recently won a very distinguished Marie Curie postdoctoral fellowship and he will be coming to UBC as part of that fellowship uh, to continue on a project, another project of mine uh, for the next three years. Uh, the Marie Curie fellowships are enormously prestigious. And as far as I've been able to ascertain, he will be a trailblazer in being the first such uh, Marie uh, Curie fellow to be present in UBC, certainly in the Faculty of Arts. If anybody else knows of past uh, Marie Curie fellows, I'd be very interested to hear about them. Another example of collaboration has been uh, one of our uh, interesting discoveries last year, which made headlines around the world when we issued a press release, was the discovery of intestinal parasites, a whipworm inside a pot, which we had uncovered, which shows that it was used as a chamber pot. And therefore, that was the first time it had been scientifically demonstrated, thanks to colleagues of mine in the University of Cambridge in the UK, where there is, can you believe, an ancient parasites laboratory in existence. And also, I'm very grateful to give you another example of my current collaboration uh, to Simon Fraser University, whose ancient DNA unit is currently investigating the DNA of horses that we have uncovered. Equid bones have been submitted to them. Uh, they've all been proved to be horses. I think we've excavated a Roman stud farm in Sicily. And now they're in the process of examining the various different breeds of horse uh, that we have represented in Sicily, whether it's Arabian or African or indigenous, for example. Now, it's the first time that's ever been done on equid bones, not only in Sicily, but also in the whole of Italy for any period. And so we are breaking fresh ground with this ongoing research. And last but far from least, I must thank my students. My students who have worked so incredibly hard in the heat of the Sicilian sun in order to provide the results uh, without which I could not have done my research. They have made an enormous contribution uh, to the achievements that I've managed to uh, do in the last few years, and I'm truly grateful to them. And it gives me enormous pleasure that a sizable contingent of those, certainly in double figures, having cut their first archaeological teeth in the heat of Sicily, are now employed in British Columbia in various different archaeological companies, and they are now themselves field archaeologists doing rescue excavations in advance of development, both here in Vancouver and in other parts of British Columbia. And it gives me enormous pleasure that they are now contributing uh, in here in British Columbia uh, because of their experiences in Sicily. So to all these people, I say an enormous thank you. Uh, without them, as I say, I would not have been able to achieve what I've achieved. And once again, I'd like to say how really grateful and honored I am to receive this award. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Roger. That was a very uh, interesting little capsule of your contributions. I now will uh, hand uh, the podium over to Sandra Bressler, who will talk about today's program. Thank, oh, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Anne. Just tell you a little anecdote about today, about Rob Carell and agreeing to speak today. Um, Bill McCutcheon and I co-chair the program committee, and he was one of the people that we wanted to have speak to. Uh, speak to a general meeting. And we had some negotiation about the dates because of his schedule and other schedules. And then we finally arrived at today's date. Well, we couldn't have chosen a better date because as you just saw, he was the recipient 
of the President's Award, and now we have the pleasure of hearing more about his achievements and about his life. So <clears throat> I just wanted to say that little comment before I give you more information about Rob Krell. He was born in Holland and survived the Holocaust in hiding, as he told you. The, the Krell family moved to Vancouver, Canada, where he obtained an MD from the University of British Columbia and eventually became professor of psychiatry. He was the director of child psychiatry and also treated Holocaust survivors and their families, as well as Dutch survivors of Japan, Japanese concentration camps. Rob established, as you heard, a Holocaust education program for high school students in 1976, an audiovisual documentation program recording survivor testimony in 1978, and assisted with the formation of child survivor groups starting in 1982. <clears throat> he served on the International Advisory Council of the Hidden Child gathering in New York in 1991 and founded the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center, which opened in 1994 and which teaches 20,000 students annually. For his activities in Holocaust education and remembrance, human rights and social justice, Rob has received the State of Israel Bonds Eli Wazel Remembrance Award the Boston University Hillel Lifetime Achievement Award, the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal, the Governor General's Caring Canadian Award, as well as special recognition from the World Federation of Jewish Child Holocaust Survivors and Descendants. <clears throat> On December 30th, 2020, he was awarded Canada's highest civilian honor, the Order of Canada. Rob has authored and co-edited co 10 books, 21 book chapters, and over 50 journal articles. His memoirs, Sounds from Silence, <clears throat> excuse me, Reflection of a Child Holocaust Survivor, Psychiatrist and Teacher, was published in 2021. <clears throat> Presently, his interests remain the psychiatric treatment of aging survivors of massive trauma, and participating in programs against race, race, racism and prejudice. He is married, has three children and nine grandchildren. I'm now going to turn the floor over to Rob. Where is Rob? Thank you, Sandra. <clears throat> where, I, where I am is unmuting. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> I have a sign on that says that you are muted, but you are hearing me now. We can hear you, yes. Terrific, thank you. Uh, to my fellow honorees, uh, congratulations, uh, Professor Patricia Shaw, Professor Roger Wilson. Uh, what incredible company to be in. Uh, dear fellow professors emeriti and dear friends, I was born on August 5, 1940, in The Hague, the Netherlands, to Leo and Ebi Krell. The country had been occupied by Germany only a few months earlier, on May 10, 1940. Uh, not a very good time for a little Jewish boy to make his first appearance. My first two years were described to me after the war ended. During that time, Dutch Jews had been deprived of ownership of radios and bicycles, were expelled from the professions, and were forbidden to go to the beach or sit on park benches. Shopping hours were restricted and Jewish children were banned from public schools. By May of 1942, Jews were forced to wear a yellow star by order of the Nazi regime and deportations had begun. Apparently, there were rumors, but no one exactly knew what was meant by resettlement to the East. It was thought to be forced labor in Germany. We received orders on August 19, 1942, 
to report to a certain place and from there on to Westerbork in North Holland. From that transit camp, every Tuesday, a train left packed with 1,000 Dutch Jews. The destinations were Auschwitz and Sobibor. In Sobibor, the arrivals were murdered within a few hours. In Auschwitz, a few men and fewer women were selected for labor and worked, starved, and beaten to death. Most women and children, including the elderly and infirm, were killed in gas chambers. Of 108,000 Dutch Jews deported, about 5,500 returned. By liberation, over 80% of Dutch Jewry had been slaughtered. Of an estimated 24,000 in hiding, over half were betrayed. My parents had not heard anything from friends who had reported in May, June, and July, May, June, and July of 1942. They simply disappeared. We went into hiding. My father found refuge in an attic of his partner in the fur business. My mother received false papers uh, um, and could pose as a Swiss expatriate uh, from the Dutch resistance and lived in a small apartment elsewhere in the city. I was placed temporarily with a neighbor, Mrs. Mulder, and then miraculously with the Munich family, Albert, Violetta, and 12-year-old Nora. I have several strong memories from my stay with Mrs. Mulder and her son, Peter Picha, and of my dad's only visit to the home of Albert, now my father, father, and Violetta, my mother, Monique, in November of 1942, where I had been placed and where the adults were teaching me not to identify my father as dad, but uncle. I also had gained the blonde sister, Nora. I became her little curly black-haired brother, Robi Menink. During hiding, I was quiet, cooperative, did not complain of illness, and never, ever cried. I stayed away from the window after one request to do so, ate my beets and tulip bulbs, and learned to read and write with Nora as my teacher. She almost got us all killed. She took me out in a buggy to visit my mother when I was about three years old. Of course, Nora was not even supposed to know her address, but about 40 years later, when I asked her why she had done that particular thing, she told me she felt that the child should see his mother. It was a risky journey, made worse when the Gestapo knocked on the door to search the apartment, and Nora and I hid under the bed while my mother convinced them to leave. No wonder that I do not remember that part of the buggy ride. There were a thousand moments of possible discovery or betrayal. We were lucky. And Frank and her family in Amsterdam were not. They were betrayed and sent to Auschwitz. And and Margot Frank died in bergen belsen While the Munichs loved me and tried to make me feel safe, I knew that something was terribly wrong. And everything that I felt and could not yet understand was clarified shortly after my liberation on May 5, 1945. The miraculous survival of both my parents resulted in my return to them. But I cried three years worth of tears upon leaving the home of my mother, father, and Nora. Fortunately, my two sets of parents remained good friends and shared me. And once again, I was Robbie Kell. Then the Holocaust came into view. I had not known I was Jewish. I began to learn quickly. My Jewish learning came from hearing the stories of Auschwitz survivors trekking through our living room. I heard of train rides of three or four days without food, water, or toilets. I heard of death and madness and whips and dogs, gas chambers and burning pits. And whatever I could not understand, they spoke in Yiddish. My eight-year-old second cousin, Millie, translated for me. The only other surviving child in our family was my first cousin, Nolly, whose parents had both been murdered. His mother was my father's sister. So now I learned that my father lost his parents and both sisters, and that my mother lost her parents, two brothers, and little sister. There were no grandparents for me, no aunts and uncles. And they had no one but me. 
My parents were not the same people. They were only five years earlier, torn from each other and their baby. They lived in fear of discovery and while were malnourished. Nolly, Millie, and I were the leftovers. We started school and played with each other. From time to time, we even went to the beach at Schevedingen and laughed as if we were normal. It was not until many years later that I learned some facts about the Shoah. I learned that one and one half million Jewish children had been murdered in Nazi-occupied territories. Fully 90% of Europe's Jewish children by the Germans and their enthusiastic collaborators. I also learned that before Auschwitz, the invading German forces after occupying Poland thrust into Belarus, Moldavia, and Ukraine. Accompanying Einsatzgruppen deployed the forced services of locals and of volunteers to massacre the Jews wherever they lived by shooting them into mass graves. Patrick Desbois, a French Catholic priest, set out to identify these graves and found elderly witnesses who described the horrors they saw as youngsters. This was the Holocaust by bullets, and the descriptions defy belief and understanding. Every witness described how the graves moved for three days. Not every shot was fatal. The wounded were simply buried alive, as were the infants not worth a bullet. The numbers are numbing. In one village, 300. In a town, 6,000. At Babiyar, a ravine in Kiev, 33,671. By 1942, one and a half million Jews had been murdered. All that in Eastern Europe. All this before Auschwitz, Treblinka, Majdanek, and Sobibor. On January 20, 1942, the final solution was planned at the Wannsee Conference near Berlin with the participation of 12 high-ranking Nazis, seven of whom had PhDs from the renowned German universities. In addition to bullets and bayonets, gassing vans and gas chambers were added to the menu of murder. Railroads formed the delivery system to the killing sites. It was an enormous operation, this war on Jews. It did not stop or slow even after D-Day, June 6, 1944. Germany had not yet cleansed Hungary's 850,000 Jews. Therefore, while finally being defeated in battle, they ramped up their genocidal war. With only two months in 1944, 440,000 Hungarian Jews were deported to Auschwitz, most gassed upon arrival. I also learned that wherever the Holocaust unfolded, the actions were twofold, that of robbery and of murder on an industrial scale. It should be noted that all of it was done with maximum cruelty and brutality, including torture and rape, beyond imagination, medical experiments, and dehumanizing huma, humiliation. As UBC professor Dr. Rudolf Verba once told me, Robert, to understand, you must know that in Auschwitz, everything was permissible. Well, it was to the perpetrators. How did Rudy know? He was at Auschwitz for 21 months before he escaped with Alfred Wetzler to warn the world of what was happening there, and particularly to warn of preparations being made to deport and murder the entire Hungarian Jewish community. We left the Netherlands for Canada in 1951. I knew that we might be successful in escaping Europe, but we could not escape the consequences of the Shoah. Throughout my life, some very smart and well-meaning people advised me to put it behind me. How wrong. One must learn to live with it, side by side with ordinary life. Many child survivors describe living life on two tracks, their concentration camp or hiding past, and simultaneously their new post-war lives. It makes sense.
I gradually left Robi Monik behind and resumed being Robi Krell. I actually experienced a melding of the two upon graduating as a physician at UBC as a member of the class of 1965. It provided a new identity. When we left Holland for Canada in 1951, I was the world's most eager immigrant. I saw Canada for what it was, a land of opportunity. Only 10 years old, I nevertheless determined that I was on my own. I was aware of my parents' suffering and preoccupations. They had to start all over once again, now aged 38 and 36, in a new language. So I worked hard not to be a burden to them. They had suffered enough. We child survivors, lucky enough to have a parent, parent of them. Remember, we were elderly children having to grow up overnight. And we had to relearn how to play and to be curious, joyful, and less serious. And I learned to cry, but never to be seen crying. Despite a shy nature and a strong wish not to be noticed, silence is the language of the hidden child. I became the class president in most of my high school years and then throughout medical school. I interned in Philadelphia, completed two years of psychiatry at Temple University Hospital, a year at Stanford in child psychiatry, and returned to Vancouver in 1969 to complete my subspecialty training, followed by a teaching fellow position, and slipped into an assistant professorship, an option that had never occurred to me. I became an academic and clinician, the director of child and family psychiatry at the UBC Health Sciences Hospital, and soon thereafter, the director of residency training, a post I held for 10 years. If the first decade of my life was dominated by the Holocaust and its reverberations, Canada appeared to present an opportunity to leave it behind. Not so. My father received a call from Australia to help clear the name of a Dutch resistance fighter whose identity he, and he himself had carried in the war. We stayed in touch with my rescuers and his. So at, at my medical graduation in 1965, Albert and Violetta Munich and Jacob and Liel Oversloot joined us in celebration. My entire medical class met them and of course became acquainted with the story. During summers at Camp Miriam, my fellow campers included some child survivors and children of survivors, but we never talked of it. As a 20 year old in 1961, I traveled Europe with my Greek buddy, Konstantin Alexander Michas, the son of the Mikas family who lived across from the Krells on West 13th, a block from Kitsilano High School. Connie was my touchstone to normality. Our friendship was rock solid. He became the kids valedictorian and followed me into medical school where we were the consecutive senior medical undergraduate representatives to the AMS Society Students Council. Connie became a surgeon. In Naples, we split up for two weeks to give Connie some time to visit family in Greece and I to visit family in Israel. And there, amongst other relatives, I visited my mother's auntie, Silka, who promptly invited me to attend the Eichmann trial. Of course, I went and saw that architect of our destruction. There was the Shoah in full force. That summer, we had begun our travels in The Hague, where I visited Mutter, Father, and Nora for the first time in 10 years. When I knocked on their door, a neighbor opened his hobby, Yes, many of the Fries. Visiting your mother? Yes, many of the Fries. How are you? I am well. I guess I never told you how disappointed I was in you. Really? Why? You never thanked me for not betraying you. Perhaps I have shared sufficient background to enter the hallowed halls of UBC, where I believe those who ever even gave it a thought the events of the Holocaust were considered to be sufficiently distant to not warrant much consideration. Well, let me tell you something, it was everywhere. One example, 
I signed up for sociology with Professor Casper D. Daly. He spotted me lined up to choose third year courses and with his engaging smile said, you look sufficiently deviant to be in my class. What is your course, Dr. Naley? He responded, it is on deviance. Well, then of course I'm in. So began what was for me a complex and puzzling relationship. Nagley was brilliant and a renowned sociologist specializing in medical sociology. He would invite me to visit his office and ask me for my take on being Jewish. I, who had struggled to formulate my version of Judaism, was far too naive for his penetrating questions. Having only decided to apply for medical school in second year after a very weak first year, taking a sociology course was risky because there was no way of getting a mark high enough to match a sciences course. No one was accepted with an average below the mid 80s. My fate was in his hands. And then he gave me a book to read, Carl Stern's Pillar of Fire, the account of a Jewish psychiatrist's conversion to Christianity. He seemed to know way before I did that I might become a psychiatrist. In any case, his mark was fortunately high enough to provide me a fighting chance for acceptance to medical school. But who was this man whose classes were filled with visitors who came just to hear him? whose students, especially young women, adored him, and who became the Dean of Arts at a very young age. I did not know until much later, long after his suicidal plunge from the sixth floor of the Vancouver General Hospital in 1964, that he was one of the young Jews expelled from Germany, first to Britain, then to Canada, where they were held in internment camps in Quebec and known as the enemy aliens. An exhibit held at the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center, the VHEC, which I founded, and which, as you heard, opens its, its doors in 1994, revealed some details of the thousands of promising intellectual youngsters that entered Canada in the early 1940s, who were viewed as potential German spies rather than victims of the Nazi regime. After being held for as long as two years, they were gradually released and seeded universities throughout Canada. At UBC, I know of three others besides Nadley, Ernest Poser, Gideon Rosenbluth, and Peter Oberlander. The one who was missed because his application to the Department of Physics was rudely rejected, Walter Cohn of the University of Santa Barbara. I know this because he attended my lecture on child Holocaust survivors there in 2004 and also my participation on a panel on genocide. That evening at dinner with Walter and his wife, Mar Mara Vishniak, he told me that he had written the head of physics at UBC, an application which stated modestly that he knew a little math and physics. The response had been something like, you will never be accepted into our program. Walter, an extraordinarily sweet soul, said it was a little over the top. He was disappointed, but went on to the United States where he subsequently received the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. Also in 1964, while serving on Students' Council as the representative of the Medical Undergraduate Society, my largely silent presence at its meetings was seriously challenged. One evening, the portentous chairman, Roger McAfee, announced that he had invited to campus a special speaker, George Lincoln Rockwell. Rockwell was the leader of the North American Nazi party. I did not see red, I saw Auschwitz. On our campus, I spoke against the plan which McAfee was selling as a free speech issue and another side of the story. Of course, there is no other side of the story except Holocaust denial, the erasure of historical fact. I couldn't envision this Nazi recruiter convincing some ripe candidates at rallies in Vancouver. A fiery young woman, the then 18-year-old Kim Campbell, representing the Frosch on campus, 
unleashed an astonishing speech against the proposal, which equally astonishingly was passed narrowly. McAfee claimed that this was an in-camera meeting and that all the counselors around the table were sworn to secrecy. I, of course, left that august chamber to place the calls necessary to expose the proposed Rockwell visit. It required more powerful to people to pull the plug, and President John McDonald did so. Rockwell did cross the border, and McAfee personally conducted an interview with him published in the UBC. About a year later, a disgruntled fellow Nazi shot Rockwell. As class president through four years of medical school, I had occasional meetings with the Dean of Medicine, Dr. John F. McCreary. Early on, he invited me to see his concept of a health sciences center. Later, I was invited to his home. There I spotted a medal with the likeness of Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands. McCreary explained that he was the pediatrician accompanying Canadian troops into Holland in order to estimate the nutritional needs of Dutch children after the hunger winter of 1944-45. He received the honor for his efforts. A few years later, at a cocktail party at his home, he told me that he had taken a day trip to Bergen-Belsen and showed me photos of mass graves that he had taken. These are now at the VHC, VHEC. Dr. McCreary, why did you not talk of this? Should doctors not know what was done? You probably knew a physician involvement in these atrocities. He responded simply, I could not talk about it. At UBC, I also met Larry Rotenberg, a 1964 medical graduate. Larry was a child survivor from Romania. He survived a concentration camp in Transistria where his parents died in his arms. And he fled into the forests, eventually taken to Sweden for his recovery from where he made his way to France to join the war orphans group accepted into post-war Canada. I went to Philadelphia where, as it happened, Larry had completed his internship and begun his psychiatric residency at Temple. At Temple, we began our conversation on survival as children. That conversation continues still today, well into our 80s. So my view of UBC was of a medical school with wonderful classmates, some nasty professors who failed 14 academically competent people out of a class of 60, uh, but was a personal success. And I had done my duty. I remained close by to my parents and little post-war brother. But during that time, pieces of Holocaust were there to remind me of our past. Daigley, McCreary, Rothenberg were representative reminders amongst the continuing contacts with my Dutch foster family and a host of my parents' family friends, nearly all of whom were immigrant survivors. Upon my return to UBC in 1969-1970, I was allowed a small private practice, and it should have been no surprise that local Holocaust survivor families brought me their children with a variety of psychiatric problems, all conventional issues that affect kids, except for one massive difference. The reverberations of the Holocaust were a complicating factor in each situation. Soon I was not only seeing children, but their parents as well. Another deeply traumatized group of patients were Dutch survivors of Japanese concentration camps. I was suddenly knee deep into facing the problems of the most intense and sadistic traumas ever inflicted on people over prolonged periods of time. Recently, a sensitive friend asked me, did it not break your heart to hear the stories of these people? The answer is, of course, yes. But someone has to listen. There is no conventional therapy other than to assist a survivor to offer their narrative of loss and despair in order to begin to focus on their resilience and strength to help them carry on. 
In short order, I began to write about Holocaust survivor families, founded a Holocaust education symposium for high school students with a few colleagues in 1976, including uh, Dr. Bill Nichols, head of the Department of Religious Studies at UBC, initiated an audiovisual testimony program taping primarily Shoah survivors in 1978, and in 1982, began a long and pioneering involvement with the welfare of child Holocaust survivors around the world, who had for many years been ignored as too young to have suffered because they had no memories. How untrue. The child Holocaust survivor movement has held annual gatherings around the world since 1991, including a 2019 gathering of some 400 souls in Vancouver, organized by Mariette Dodek, a Belgian child survivor, and myself. As for reminders in my life as a UBC professor of psychiatry, I offer my knowing some of the following people, having known. A survivor, Alexander Yakubovitz, worked in the neurosciences department of psychiatry, Auschwitz survivor. My colleague, Dr. Ferdinand Knobloch, a non-Jewish survivor of concentration camp Flossenburg, showed me the photo of his darling Jewish wife at every opportunity. She was murdered in Auschwitz. Ludmilla Lola Zeldowitz was a neurologist. Her husband, Henry Zeldowitz, a fellow psychiatrist at UBC. Lola escaped the Warsaw Ghetto through the sewers of the city. Henry had escaped to Italy and spoke Italian with a heavy Polish-Yiddish accent. My colleague and friend, Dr. Peter Sudfeld, a former head of the Department of Psychology and former Dean of Graduate Studies, is a child survivor from Budapest. His mother was murdered in Auschwitz. I videotaped his account. And some years later, we collaborated on research concerning the coping abilities of adult survivors. In the pharmacology building, Rudolf Verba taught and conducted research. His escape from Auschwitz with Alfred Wetzler on April 7, 1944, led to the report known as the Auschwitz Protocols, which eventually forced Admiral Horthy of Hungary to halt the deportations of Hungarian Jewry, the only one still alive in Budapest. The historian, of Winston, the historian of Winston Churchill and renowned historian of the Holocaust, Sir Martin Gilbert, estimated that Verba was responsible for saving at least 120,000 Jewish lives. Nearby worked Nellie Auersberg, MD and PhD, a cancer researcher at UBC. She survived with her mother, avoiding deportation through a friend who had them jailed for their safety. While all the others were sent to concentration camps, they made it. Nellie's family were the Blockbauers, and her aunt Adele was the subject of the famous Gustav Klimt painting. There was much to be learned at UBC. Vladimir Krajina, who I did not know, had been the head of Czechoslovakian resistance. There was also Jacob Lachins, a Dutch Nazi collaborator, the terror of Roden, found guilty in absentia of murder in Holland. UBC students marched in favor of his retaining his position as a botany lecturer. I protested to the Dutch embassy and was told only one other person from UBC had done so. Now that I have offered an accounting of some life events that helped shape my views, I want to address the title of my talk today, Ethno-Political Violence, Views of a Child Holocaust Survivor, Psychiatrist. Psychiatrist. It was not my choice. I prefer the impact of the Holocaust at UBC. How did it come to be ethno political violence? In 2021, I was a recipient of the Order of Canada. The citation reads Robert Krell is a scholar, educator, and advocate for Holocaust survivors. As director of family and child psychiatry at the University of British Columbia, he made groundbreaking contributions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Founder of the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center, he established outreach programs to advance our understanding 
of mass ethno-political violence and to advocate for social justice and human rights. Mass ethno-political violence, where did that come from? Certainly not my nominators, they would not use that terminology. So who inserted the term? Perhaps someone unfamiliar with the Holocaust? It sounded to me like the domain of a political scientist, but to subsume the Holocaust under ethno-political violence smacks of Holocaust distortion, if not denial. Uh, I was not successful in uh, changing the minds of those who had invited me to speak, but uh, I thought it was uh, worth showing up to remind everyone to be careful with words. Genocide is not unique. But within the spectrum of those catastrophic human-inspired tragedies, the Holocaust stands unique. And in fact, so are the Armenian, Cambodian, and Rwandan genocides unique. Each had its own perilous concoction of ingredients to inspire mass murder. And each, along with so many others, deserves its own understanding and consideration, its own memorialization and process of healing. The term ethno-political violence buries all of that. If you uh, mention that you're going to give a talk on ethno-political violence, no one would know what genocides you would be addressing, if any. The definition of genocide was inspired by Rafael Lemkin, a Polish Jew who had taken up the cause of the Armenian Christians massacred by the Turks in the First World War and succeeded to have the concept of genocide form the basis of the United Nations Convention on the Prevent Prevention and Punishment for the Crime of Genocide after the Second World War in 1948. So let's be careful not to bury the Holocaust under inappropriate language. Ethno-political violence simply does not evoke the Shoah rather a wide variety of possible conflicts that deserve careful definition and context. My citation, by the way, has been rewritten. Founder of the VHEC helped establish Holocaust and genocide education programs to combat racism, prejudice, and anti-Semitism, and to advocate for social justice and human rights. I was fortunate to know Elie Wiesel the Auschwitz and Buchenwald survivor who was liberated at age 16 and who became a renowned writer, speaker, and human rights activist. His powerful book, Night, shattered a decade-long post-war silence during which survivors tried to regain their footing. I met him in 1978 when serving on a small committee to bring him to Vancouver to speak at a Yom HaShoah day of the Holocaust Remembrance event. In 1986, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. We stayed in touch for life. Sadly, his ended in 2016, and I miss him every day for not being in the world. We need him. On one occasion, I asked Eli if he would consider coming to UBC so we could confer a doctorate. His response, arrange it, and I will come. I arranged it in 2012, he came. We shared a car to the ceremony and Ellie said, see Robert, I keep my promises. Now please understand, by that time, he had over 120 honorary doctorates, the Medal of Valor of France, the Congressional Medal from the United States and had turned down the presidency of the State of Israel. After all, he said, what do I know of politics? I am only a writer. So he did not need another doctor, doctorate, uh, but I felt we needed him, and we still do. Professor Wiesel had written and spoke of the words whose essence I convey here. What was the meaning of it all? What was the meaning of the murder of one and one half million innocent Jewish children? It was meaningless. Therefore, we must confer meaning. This is a challenge for you as distinguished educators, particularly in retirement after years of learning and teaching. 
I implore you to inspire your various faculties to provide Holocaust education, to examine what was thought to be impossible, the perversion of the law, medicine, architecture, engineering, journalism, theology, and philosophy, all put to the services of committing a genocidal crime. So it is possible if that happened in the most sophisticated society of the last century. Remember, seven of 12 participants in the Wadse Conference there to shape the final solution helped PhDs from Germany's great institutions of learning. Medical doctors performed unconscionable experiments and lawyers constructed the racial Nuremberg laws, the building blocks of exclusion and ultimately of murder. The lessons should be obvious. Thank you for your kind attention. Oh. I just have a few words. I'm just overwhelmed by your talk today, Rob. We really had a privilege to hear your remarkable life story. The powerful and chill, the chilling events of the Shoah and your, your continuing contribution to keeping people aware of all that has happened. And most importantly, I know you spoke about us as emeritus educators, but I feel most importantly that the students of today and future generations need to remember, need to understand, and need to be educated in all that has happened. So on behalf of the Emeritus College, I want to thank you for a really profound, profound talk with us today. We do have some time for questions, and I'm sure Rob would be very happy to answer any that you might have. I will try. You will try. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to see hands, so I wonder if you would like to um, write your question in the chat, in the meeting chat. Any comments? Could I just blurt out a question? Absolutely. Yeah, I was very moved by your personal account, Dr. Corral, um, but a little confused about your apparent rejection of the term ethnopolitical violence. As a sociologist, the term does appeal to me, and I'm wondering, is it that it undermines the distinctiveness of the Holocaust? Or, or somehow it attacks the sanctity of its memory that leads you to reject that term? Maybe you can clarify your feelings about that. Thank you for your wonderful question. Um, a part of it, uh, I am sure, is my, is my own uh, uh, a lack of understanding of the concept. And so, uh, of course, I looked it up and couldn't find any clear uh, definition. So uh, even Google didn't help me in this particular situation. Uh, I did think when I saw it as ethnopolitical violence, I thought this must be the domain precisely of a so sociologist or a political scientist. But uh, let's look at the, the practical situation. Somebody introduced me as an expert in ethno-political violence. I wouldn't be able to say anything about it. Uh, if someone said, well, I have uh, examined from a personal perspective and research perspectives and his history books, uh, the Holocaust, that would define my area of expertise. So yes, it does to my mind, bury the Holocaust under a term that no one would really even guess refers to the Shoah. 
He's an expert on ethno-political violence, or he has something attributed to the knowledge of ethno-political violence. Until I, until I then define it, no one would know wherein lies my expertise or preoccupations or fields of study. So I'm going to read a comment there. We have a few comments um, from Wendy Hall. Thank you for an excellent description of your life and your work from Barbara Benhart to everybody. No question, but it was a powerful talk. Thank you. Peter Dodick, thank you for the very powerful and personal presentation and for the inspiration to never forget and learn from this tragedy. I think those are all very, very, very. Thank oh, you. Another one from Paul Morantz. How And this is a question, Paul, from Paul. How do you understand the current resurgence of anti-Semitism when so many of us had hoped that the lessons of the Holocaust had been learned? Good question. Paul, oh, yes. Resurgence of anti-Semitism? Yes. Uh, for 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 someone for someone like me, um, it, it's it's absolutely frightening that there is a resurgence of anti-Semitism, but it's not a surprise. Uh, in Holland, after almost all its do, Dutch Jewish community was murdered, there was more anti-Semitism after the war than existed before. For the few remaining Jews. Uh, in Holland. This is a remarkable thing because Holland had a, a long tradition of tolerance and, uh, you know, such a thing as a, a pogrom, a massacre of Jews in the streets had never taken place. So uh, it, it was a mystery to me as a young boy uh, growing up, learning about Judaism after the war and everything that had happened to see a resurgence of anti-Semitism then. I, I have not lived in a decade where there has not been a resurgence. There is something so durable about anti-Semitism and so durable about the need for uh, a country in trouble uh, to have scapegoats. And within countries for groups to have someone to persecute, diminish, uh, and provide itself with the various conspiracy theories on which they feed. It, it is a phenomenon, uh, certainly beyond, beyond my understanding, and I've read uh, a number of experts on anti-Semitism who remain, even after they write an erudite book, as puzzled and befuddled as they were before. Uh, it is something to be fought. And I think one of the lessons that seems to be hardest to learn, and I said this to a, a, a high school symposium a, a week or so ago, uh, 500 students uh, of all mixed backgrounds, of all cultures, they were wonderful, they listened well, they asked, they asked similar questions to yours, Paul. And I said, well, one of the things that seems not to have been learned from all of this is that people somehow think that they are not Next, where anti-Semitism flourishes, where anti-Semitism has a resurgence, the danger of it is not only to Jews, it is, it is a generalized problem, it's a universal problem. There are things that are happening in our society all the time that make people vulnerable. In a place where anti-Semitism thrives, no one else is safe. Look what happened, for example, in Poland. Millions of Jews were murdered in Poland. So long, so long as that was the situation, a certain number uh, actively participated in that alongside the Germans, the Nazis who invaded. Uh, not long after Nazis had done what they wish to do, which is murder some 3 million of the 3.3 million Jews there. 
they went after the Poles because the next group who were inferior were the Slavs. At the end of World War, although the persecution didn't take the same form, you know, at the end of the war, at liberation, there were one million Polish Christians in concentration camps. Once, once such activities take hold, you never know who is next. Sometimes somebody else is first, but it certainly, if it begins with Jews, it never ends with Jews. That seems to be a lesson not learned. Hmm. Any other any other comments or questions? You've got one there from Paul Harrison. Sandra. Oh, sorry, I couldn't see. Thank you. It's all the polls. <laughs> Uh, are you, uh, Dr. Krell, are you concerned that today in contemporary society, um, there are worrying developments in Germany that could lead to a resurgence of that awful behavior once again within Germany? Um. No, actually, what I think of when I think of wor worrisome developments, I don't think of Germany first at all. Uh, uh, Germany has made significant steps in the arena of remembrance, and uh, and uh, it should, and should it should remember its history absolutely. Uh, but that's not upon this, uh, the next generations. What's upon the next generations of Germans is you know, to to know their history in order to prevent anything like that bubbling up again. But there are countries where these developments are worrisome. In Poland, for example, there's a, an attempt to suppress knowledge of the possibility that there existed Poles who participated in the slaughter of Jews. Oh, well documented, but, um, uh, you know, uh, resisted by the government and uh, that leads to, uh, re to uh, attempts to rewrite history. Uh, there are resurgence of difficulties with right-wing groups in uh, Hungary and uh, France, everywhere. It pops, it, it, it pops up and all of it, all of it must be fought tooth and nail right from the get-go. Anti-Semitism, has to be fought at least to a standstill. I don't think it will ever be eliminated. People just seem to enjoy having it too much. We do have a question from Paul Harrison. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Has the education of medical students changed since your student days to include the historical aberration of medical practice that you described under the Nazi regime? What a wonderful question. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I have made efforts, not, not all of them successful. Um, uh, I taught for 18 years a course on massive psychologic trauma in uh, the Department of Psychiatry to senior residents. Um, uh, it was a course that was uh, much loved. Uh, especially because uh, I brought in uh, uh, survivors so that uh, my resident students could speak with a survivor about how they handle massive trauma. And my teachers included a Cambodian psychiatrist who'd been in concentration camps, uh, a South American psychiatrist who had dealt with the situation of the disappeared in Argentina. And it ground to a halt in 2000 with a very peculiar and complicated accusation against me that involved the uh, equity officer of the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, so that, uh, that was stopped. I think I was uh, the subject of one of the first 
of the cancel culture movement, uh, but uh, made, made no stink about it. I was too busy teaching to get involved in that. Uh, at the medical school level, like I've told you, uh, uh, that even uh, Dean McCreary was unable to speak about the experiences that he had. So there were, for, there were decades probably where it would have been impossible to introduce anything. There is a ray of light, a huge ray of light. Uh, in the past year, a committee headed by uh, Rosalind Goldner uh, is examining uh, a permanent Holocaust education curriculum for the Faculty of Medicine, I believe, uh, within the framework of medical ethics. We're working on that. I'm very hopeful for it. It is so necessary for physicians to know what is possible when you actually abandon the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, it, it, it is a warning. I don't think that any medical student without Holocaust education would know that they're vulnerable to the possibility of being swayed in one direction or another that represents sadistic approaches to people's care rather than the healing approaches. And, and what if we get to a situation where the average Canadian cannot trust those we all try to trust, we want to trust our physicians, to look after us. We want to trust our lawyers to protect our rights. We want to uh, uh, have our engineers build safe bridges. Every profession, every profession under the Nazi regime was perverted and we must prevent such things from happening. So we need to be alert. And certainly I would say within the Faculty of Medicine at UBC or any, any of our major medical schools across Canada. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody for attending this afternoon. It's wonderful to see how many people <clears throat> joined the Zoom meeting. And especially, excuse my voice, I want to thank Dr. Robert Corral for giving us, as I said before and was mentioned again, a most powerful, powerful lecture today. So on behalf of the Marriages Co College, a sincere thank you for your time. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you very much. Sandra, would you like to take a moment to tell us uh, some of the plans that you're thinking about for program <clears throat> upcoming? Thank you for reminding me of what I'm supposed to say in the script here. I want to say I thanked everyone for coming and that this, as you know, is our last big event for the spring and be the and <clears throat> will be the final lecture of the Wall Catalyst program where the members of the Emeritus College cohort will present. Uh, this event on May 18th is free and includes lunch. In addition to this community volunteer, in addition to the community volunteer group, they will be hosting Dr. Deborah Buzard to hear her experiences with community volunteerism on May 23rd. Visit, <clears throat> visit the um, Emeritus College website for more information about both these events. So we look forward to seeing you at those events as well. And you've been talking about uh, uh, venues for programs uh, in the coming year. Hmm. Give us a hint. <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> this is um, yesterday we had a meeting of the program cluster, and we just we have some wonderful ideas for uh, different programs that we plan to offer next year. We also discussed it, discussed the in-person versus Zoom meetings. Is this what you wanted me to mention, Anne? And we talked about the, we really had a, a very healthy discussion about the pros and cons of in-person meetings versus Zoom meetings 
and sensitive to people having more access to Zoom if they don't live in the Vancouver area. However, we wanted to be brave because we felt that there was so much missing from not being able to have a meeting in person at general meetings. And so we are proposing and this is, we, it hasn't been finalized, but we thought that we would try to have our general meetings be in-person meetings uh, so that there would be a social time, a time that people could uh, engage with each other, attend the general meeting. And also, I know in the past there have been sessions where Emeriti have displayed artwork, have displayed books that they've written, and it would be a time for them to show others what they have been doing in retirement as part of the emeritus community. So um, it is up for discussion, but we felt that we would try and see how our response is to this. And certainly we can always adjust re ourselves. The committee did not feel that hybrid was the best solution because those that have experienced hybrid meetings found that the people that attended in person was very small. So that defeated the social part of getting together. So I think that it's fair to share that with you. And um, I now who, who would be receiving comments? I guess it would be me. If you have comments and would like to discuss this further, certainly um, we can do this. But this is a tentative plan. Thanks, Sandra. I can uh, just add that uh, yesterday, uh, the leaders of committees and the uh, College Council, about 30 of us, uh, met in person, uh, no hybrid uh, uh, option at the Indian Residential School uh, History and Dialogue Center. And in addition to having a terrific program, it was fabulous meeting in person and having the opportunity to just have a chit chat with folks. We had lunch following uh, the discussion. And uh, I, th I think it's a good move for us to look at um, returning to a more normal uh, style of interaction with our programs, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I, I think that this is now the end, I know this is now the end of the program. Again, thank you for all attending and we look forward to seeing you at general meetings as well as others in the future. Thank you. And I think on that note, we close the program. Thank you everybody for attending today.